think you'd have to agree with me. It's amazing how far a little dab of paint will take you. Far from the beginning, far from our beginning. No doubt I'll leave the history lessons to others, but I will say, as I have viewed your career from afar, I have watched with the warrior's admiration and unconditional respect. The ultimate warrior was the ultimate warrior. <laughs> When people want to talk about one of the greatest physiques in pro wrestling history, they're going to say, oh, Ultimate Warrior is going to be right up there, you know. You had kids that wanted to be a pro wrestler because of him. I mean, that, that really speaks volumes right there, you know. They wanted to be like the Ultimate Warrior. <laughs> that, that's pretty amazing. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. If you've ever had an idea for a podcast and didn't know where to start, let me tell you about Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop place for all your podcast needs. First off, it's absolutely free and very easy. Anchor has all the creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And even better, Anchor will actually distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. The best part? You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Gentlemen, welcome to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling. I'm Dean Hill. See you at ringside. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling podcast. And today, I think we've got a cool idea here. I'm going to introduce my co-host, my brother from the same mother, Judd the Plastic Sheik. What's up, Judd? How are you doing? What's up, brother? How are we doing? Oh, man, I'm doing good. Just, you know, kind of keeping the boat on the water here, trying to knock out a show that I've been wanting to do and that you have helped me, you know, think of these ideas and stuff. And so today we've obviously, as you see on the show, we've got What If, Sting, and Ultimate Warrior. People that listen to the show, my idea for this show is basically, what if Sting and the Ultimate Warrior took different paths? So let's say at the time of the Blade Runners breaking up, Sting goes to world class as the Dingo Sting or the Stingo Warrior. <laughs> 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 and, and then the ultimate warrior goes to Bill Watts and then ends up in WCW. Now, again, we are going to try to take it that way. But the ultimate goal of this is I didn't know this, man. But did you know that they both won their perspective titles in 1990? I mean, that's crazy to think that they had meteoric rises in each of their organizations and their opponents you know, Hogan with the Warrior and Flair with Sting are, are you know, they're two of, you know, they built basically what wrestling is today. Um, you know, I know people want to crap on Hogan, whatever. Man, if it wasn't for Hogan, we wouldn't have a lot of the wrestling we have today. Yeah, but what I'm just saying is, isn't it crazy? No, no, it's, yeah, it is crazy that they have the same, like it, their their careers line up so much. Yeah, it, it, it gets it's it's kind of eerie how much they're but then they were so different, right? So different. It seemed like their perspective on life, the way they acted towards other people, fans and the like, you know, totally different. But w what's crazy is basically within months of each other, they culminated their title. The warrior wins at WrestleMania six versus Hogan in right. the ultimate showdown. And then Sting beats Ric Flair at the Great American Bash in 1990. Now. You know, what we're going to do here is essentially we're going to break down a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about their start, talk a little bit about their path. But my main goal here is to kind of say, OK, like if Ultimate Warrior took on these 
opponents and Sting took on these opponents, how different would have things turned out? Essentially, what we're asking here, Jared, is what if? (laughs) What if? Yeah, that's our idea for today. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but I kind of wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. So how's things going with you, man? Y'all have a good Halloween and stuff? Yeah, man, we had a good one. The kids, uh, you know, they they enjoy it as always. We had, you know, big haunting on Main Street here in town. and Yeah, I saw uh, that. that. Paxton dressed up as the Hulk and nice. Paisley uh, dressed up as a student at Hogwarts, I guess, in, in the Ravenclaw. Okay. Yeah. And I know, I know, I don't know, I don't know much about Harry Potter, so forgive my ignorance, but um, <laughs> me either. Me either. Yeah. Ravenclaw, uh, somebody told her once she was a Ravenclaw, so uh, she, she liked it. So she has this little robe and she has a wand thing. So gotcha. I love how specific she is about it. She's not necessarily oh, yeah. a character, she is a random student yeah. in the Ravenclaw. And again, Harry Potter fans, this is not give me back my Harry Potter. So yeah. please. It's not give me back my wizarding world. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. We'll give us a break on that. Maybe yeah. that podcast will start later down the line with Paisley or something. But anyway, there you go. at this point. So yeah, Cash dressed up like the butcher from the boys. So, you know, oh. a totally different perspective from your kids to mine, you know, oh, 16 okay. year yeah. old. And I, you know, of course, I don't think he went trick or treating, but he did. He was Billy the Butcher in from the boys. So, yeah, two <laughs> totally different perspectives. But he's a 16-year-old, so what are you going to do, right? I'm just – There you go. I'm glad he was, you know, he wasn't in any trouble. Let's just go with that. He's teenage boys, you know? So, yeah. yeah. So anyway, a last show that we had was good. It was a watch along show. We watched Halloween Havoc 89. You know, we're getting some good numbers from that. It does appear like people are watching the matches. It's funny because you can see in the analytics how things go and it's like dot, dot, dot section. And then they skip the commercials. So, (laughs) you know, don't skip the commercials y'all we get you know that sometimes you've heard them before but these are our buddies podcast and right now we're not in an advertising spot although gmbmpw at gmail.com will give you more details on that if you are interested in advertising with us but at this point it's our buddies podcast we just like to promote them i think every one of them have put really something cool into those i've even made a couple of those so for sure listen to them support those other podcasts you know like to give me back my podcast network give me back my action movie give me back my horror i think they've just knocked off a fun month with all their movies monster movie stomp down did a top 10 had 10 mini episodes in a row which is awesome and then of course you've got the other shows on the network good beer bad movie night of course us the other show that's under our umbrella that i'm really proud of right now is mike jablonski's pissed off have you listened to any of those jared i listened to all of them yeah it does a good job yeah here's the thing man i think he's hilarious and mike has just got such a perspective on the wrestling business and he's so passionate about it but mike's way of getting his thoughts out to me it's like he could explode at any minute so it's it's awesome and thank you mike of course we appreciate you being on the team give me back my pro wrestling so anyway i think i've swept up the ashes oh by the way i'll just say it greg Gagne is about to break the yeah a big time mark for us i'm i don't go into number specifics because i think it's tacky but let's just say greg Gagne is the biggest show we've ever done and i don't know that i mean i hope we eclipse it with other shows i hope this episode does that but holy cow it you know it's <laughs> four times it's- three times more than some of our shows four times more than some of our episodes so yeah it's definitely been pleasant to see those numbers and to know that you know we're reaching that kind of audience and that hey that people maybe like to listen to us a little bit maybe more greg Ganya they like to listen to but maybe uh, m- yeah. maybe they like us too i think so i do think they enjoy us and i think we're kind of seen as the little podcast that could and I, i'm cool with that you know however you listen to us we appreciate it so the last episode i said something that i wanted to clarify really quick our youtube is very important we really appreciate that you listen to this through the podcatchers that's actually where we prefer you to listen but never would we tell you where to listen the one thing that i said incorrectly is we do the chic shorts on youtube for you to 
essentially leave YouTube and download the podcast versus Mike Jablonski is supposed to lead you to our YouTube. It's it's kind of like a circle. And I didn't say it correctly, but the Chic Shorts, you built those specifically to build interest to our podcast, whereas yeah. Mike Jablonski's is a separate thing that we want to to build our YouTube. So it kind of, it's like one hand washes the other kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't know that I needed to clear that up, but I just felt like I should. All right. So I think that's housekeeping for right now. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back with what if sting and the ultimate warrior. Hey guys, this is Wolfie D from PG 13. Check out my podcast live and in color with Wolfie D every Monday at noon. We're talking Memphis. We're talking ECW, WCW, WWF, everywhere that I've been. We even have some great guests, some hall of famers on the show with us every Monday live and in color with Wolfie D. This is the big picture. Michael Jablonski. Don't forget to tune in every week to Jablonski's pissed off on the give me back my pro wrestling YouTube channel. He's gonna tell you all about it He doesn't care what you think You're gonna hear all about it By Jump Lutzke All right, we're back. Give me back my pro wrestling presents. What if sting and the ultimate warrior? And I just realized something people are going to think our only what if ideas is are, sting. are with sting. <laughs> hey, yeah. what can we say? We love sting, right? I mean, you know, we'll, what if, for our next what if episode, what if the <laughs> WWE had used sting properly? Yeah, yeah, exactly. What if? Amen. That could be it. Actually, that's on the list. Go ahead and write that yeah. down. So what, what's funny is our next episode, we're going to do something fun. It's either going to be an interview. I, I've got a couple interviews lined up that we just haven't made happen yet. Or there's a possibility of we do a little crossover with the superheroes and wrestling. We'll figure that all out. But either way, our next episode is going to be really fun. But the more important is this episode. So, all right, I'm going to do a little, you know, professorism prehistory here for Sting and Ultimate Warriors What If. Okay, so as most people know, they were trained by Rick Bassman and Red Bastine. Now, Red Bastine is a longtime old schooler, trained a ton of people. If you look up Red Bastine, literally his name is above a lot of people as far as, you know, the body guys and stuff like that. Rick Bassman, you may have heard that name before. If you've heard the names John Cena, Samoa Joe. Anyway, he ran the promotion in California, UPW. And again, you know, probably early on, you know, his biggest stars were Sting and the Ultimate Warrior, but did turn into John Cena probably being his biggest star that came out of his camp. Now, you know, essentially they started out, they were bodybuilders. I think the Ultimate Warrior was even like a world champion bodybuilder or was going on that path. And Sting was also a bodybuilder. Now, he they, a warrior had definitely won some uh, events. I think, was he Mr. Indiana, maybe? Something, something like that. it, uh, at yeah, least. So, something yeah. like that. Yeah, something like that. He was definitely had his body looking good. Now, they joined a team of bodybuilders. The, the other guys you've never heard of, if you have, I'm impressed, is Garland Denoho and Mark Miller. They formed a professional wrestling team called Power Team USA. I got to imagine it's got to be a little bit of a thing. I mean, have you seen this picture? That, that Yeah, there's like four of them like, around him, and they're all like jacked and supposedly... Um, you know, was it somebody's wherever they got their start said, yeah, give me that one and that one. I want those two. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it, it was a picture that was sent to Jerry Jarrett. Basically, Jerry, Jerry, Jarrett, right. yeah, Jerry Jarrett picked them out of a photo and they came to Memphis, the CWA, as a team called the Freedom Fighters, Flash and Justice. And they were baby faces at first, but they turned heel under coach Buddy Wayne and then Dutch. So, basically, they turned heel because of their size. Literally, you went to Memphis and they were monsters compared to tag teams like the Rock oh, yeah. and Roll Express and the other guys. Memphis just isn't a big baby face town. They're not. They've never been monster. So, you know, Lawler's not a huge guy. Uh, you know, the, a lot, but Bill Dundee is definitely not a huge guy, but they would bring in these monsters to work against these guys. And that's what essentially did not click with them initially as baby faces on that Freedom Fighters team. So then they became heels and they had Coach Buddy Wayne. Now, anybody that listens to the Live and in Color with 
Wolfie D podcast has heard many stories about Buddy Wayne. Buddy Wayne ran an outlaw show, but actually worked with the CWA as well, but he ran his own outlaw shows, and Buddy tried to strip the tag titles of PG-13 off of them for two guys that were kind of like developmental guys. He said, you guys that would never, the crowd would never buy that y'all could beat them boys in the ring, and Wolfie and Jamie said, no thank you, and they left and went to Applebee's and got drunk, apparently, but... <laughs> they said no we're not doing it and so long story short Lawler would have fired PG-13 had they dropped those belts to those guys had it not been sanctioned you know mm-hmm. so Buddy Wayne that's where you may have heard his name through the Wolfie D show then they of course worked under Dutch Mantel which you know Dutch was also a great wrestler and a manager at the same time great on the microphone they left the CWA in January of 86 so their trajectory is kind of they've moved through Memphis then they end up in Bill White territory they turn into the blade runners again just like i said about the powers of pain these are some sons of the lod you know what i'm saying jim helwig the ultimate warrior was named rock and then of course blade runner sting that's a no-brainer and this was of course in the faction hot stuff international and so at that point helwig they, they do their little run as the Blade Runners. You know, people say they're horrible. They couldn't wrestle their way out of a wet paper bag. I think I've heard Dutch say that several times. You know, not really good. But again, man, they've really came up to a year, not even a year yet that they've been in wrestling. So, you know, it's kind of hard. But then Helwig leaves the UWF in 86. Now, one thing we've learned from Magnum TA interview and several other interviews is that Bill was UWF territory was horrible travel and really not great pay unless you were a superstar there. And so obviously I could see Helwig leaving the UWF in 86. Now, the warrior, he ends up now when I say Helwig, obviously you should know that I mean the ultimate warrior. So Helwig goes to world class as the Dingo warrior and he's managed initially by Gary Hart. And then he ends up with Percy Pringle until literally just like normal days. Now fans turned him into a baby face, right? Yeah, he then started teaming with the literal last of the line. I think he's not even a real Von Erich with Lance Von Erich. They turn into the Blade Runners until 1987 when he left for the WWF to become the Ultimate Warrior. Now, if you read McMahon, when he gets there, they're like, what's a dingo? You know, Mm -hmm. and I think they're trying to make up a name now. There's at that time, there's the road warriors, right? Right. And there's the modern day warrior, Kerry Von Eric. You know, there's probably some other warrior out there somewhere, but long story short, McMahon said, let's make him the ultimate warrior. You know, with that being said, I've even heard people bring this up before. Have you ever heard that he is a Native American gimmick? Do you think? Hmm. I don't know that I've ever heard that, but. I mean, they didn't go like to Tonka with him or anything like that. I mean, like, right, right. Yeah, they did. Um, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, it could be. I know I heard that uh, that Dingo, somebody had a dog named Dingo and they kind of gave him that name or something like that in world class. So I don't, I don't know. Well, but I got a yeah. question for you just to interrupt you real quick. So are they, are they sons of the road warriors as the freedom fighters or not until they get to be the Blade Runners. Yeah, no, I, I think it's only when they become the Blade Runners that they okay. are true sons of the Road Warriors, in my opinion, because, you know, the Freedom Fighters, I, I don't even think they wore face paint. I could be wrong about that. Yeah, I'm not positive. I know they I know they just wore a little bit as the Blade Runners, kind of not, not. It was like their little eye. I, yeah. yeah. But still, big, massive monster tag team with a little bit of face paint, black pants. It's Sons of the Road Warriors. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Go ahead. And, and also, when they left uh, Watts territory, or when uh, Helwig left, he Sting stayed and finished, right? He did, yeah. Now, as we as we you know know, he ends up in the WWF as the Ultimate Warrior, but Sting stayed back in Watts UWF until the eventual Jim Crockett buyout in 1987. I think he stayed in Hot Stuff International with Eddie Gilbert and Rick Steiner, and they end up again becoming part of Jim Crockett when Crockett buys out the dying UWF, and of course. 
course, Crockett and them did not know that at the time. So Bill Watts and Jim Ross effectively ripped Jim Crockett off because Crockett could have literally picked up the scraps had he waited a few more months. But instead, yeah. Jim Ross came in and oversold it. Now, again, some great territories, some great performers, all that. But still, I do believe it's even been said by Jim Ross that essentially they ripped off Jim Crockett, you know, quote unquote. So now, all right, early on, what do you remember about Sting coming into Crockett? Do you remember when he came in? Uh, kind of one of the first things I remember, it was in a six man tag match, something mm-hmm. uh, with uh, Garvin and Hayes. Yeah, Garvin and Hayes. And I think and that they was were Starcade, right? Yeah, yeah Starcade. Yeah. And they were against like, um, was it Scott Steiner or Rick? Was it Eddie Gilbert? Yes, definitely Eddie Gilbert. Absolutely. And Zabisco. Yeah, and Zabisco. And, and I think one of the, I think maybe Scott. I was thinking Scott Steiner, but I could be. It may be Rick Steiner. Yeah, fact checkers, let us know on that one. But anyway, what I initially remember, you know, Steen comes and he is like a a daylight version of the road warriors to me. Yeah, he's, that's true. He's, that's he's awesome. He looks amazing. He's got a great look about him. Blonde. I, I ripped his haircut off all the time, but you know, <laughs> Red blonde, telling all. Br- yeah, exactly. Blonde spiked hair with bright color makeup, you know, his own look and style too. Some of his early makeups are really cool. I mean, he really did some awesome stuff before he picked a more, regular style yeah. you know the pattern that warrior and sting both adapted ended up looking you know a little more uniform over the years but you know bright colors a lot more opposite he came out you know did the king kong gorilla hitting his chest and screaming which i love that which i love that oh dude his fire up with that was incredible you know so you know and and then on the other side of things in 87 at the same time i remember this guy in a long hair he looked like a, a muscled up rock and roller paint running to the ring and beating the crap out of every jobber that he could get a hold of yeah. iron, iron mike sharp barry horowitz i mean then steve lombardi the names go on and on basically warrior ran through jobbers like nobody's business whereas on the other side of things you know sting of course is getting his tv matches where he's beating the crap out of jobbers but he was kind of put a little more in the thing and i can i think that almost says something to the two ways that the companies ran their their shows you know yeah, McMahon wanted the spectacle of everything. Right. right. Uh, whereas Crockett wanted wrestling. Um, exactly. Exactly. And, and that's and that's where we'll get into how interesting it would be if they switched places. I mean, to put it flatly, it may have not worked at all for one of the parties. Yeah, yeah. I'm agreeing with that. But I tell you what, let's go that way with it first i say let's let's look at the warrior because sting you know was working and doing a lot of interviews i remember in 87 and then really his first major was at the clash one against flair in 88 okay yeah so now we're entering the what if zone okay so i'm gonna go ahead and hit the noise for the what if zone And here instead, let's do this. So it's 87, or let's say this, it's 86. And Sting is tired of the Blade Runners and tired of the traveling and the underpay and everything. So he leaves the UWF, Bill Watts, and he goes to world class, okay? And everything goes... He becomes the Stingo Warrior, whatever. The Flash Warrior. <laughs> the Flash Warrior and everything. And on the other side of things, Helwig, the Ultimate Warrior, stays in the UWF. And instead of his traveling to world class and going through those and getting with Gary Hart, Percy Pringle, honestly, you know, it was a great idea for him to stay. He decides to stay back in the UWF, stay in Hot Stuff International, and be a part of the Jim Crockett buyout. And on TBS one night, you see the Ultimate Warrior, or whatever he is at that time, show up. So for the sake of telling the story 
let's pretend that he became the ultimate warrior in name only. Okay. Right. Okay. So instead of staying the, whatever he was, a flash or no, I'm sorry. He was instead of him staying justice yeah, <laughs> or justice. Not, not justice. I'm sorry. Instead of him staying rock, he, yeah. you know, which would have been hilarious on down the line had he stayed <laughs> rock. But, you know, can you imagine the rock says under <laughs> the stars and the moon, you know, so the r- load the rocket ship with the rocket fuel. Yeah, the rock it fuel anyway. Yeah. So he stays in UWF and he ends up being bought out and then he shows up. Now, I picked a list here and I'm just let's just play along here and let's see how okay. long. We think the ultimate warrior will last. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. So I've got a list of stings, you know, honestly, really through like 94 or so. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm pretending like we stop basically around the time the ultimate warrior originally stopped wrestling in the WWF. And that's kind of our end point. Okay. okay. The, the biggest point being 1990, but again, we're figuring this out as we go. So he starts and his first big match is, the Ultimate Warrior versus Ric Flair at the first Clash of the Champions in 1988. Okay. Now, many say that is when Sting was made by Ric Flair. Okay. Right. Absolutely. I mean, and that that is what is always said. I'll so, agree with it. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Can you imagine this? All right. The reason Sting got so over in Jim Crockett is this. He came to Jim Crockett. He was needed Early on, if you think Magnum's accident, all right, had to be a big blow as far as their main up and coming baby faces. Okay. Ready for prime time. Magnum was right there. Then his accident happens. All right. A second issue that Sting got so over so quickly was Nikita was Russian. Okay. So even though Nikita was getting over and popular as a baby face, he was still Russian. He still held on to that Ajadoa accent, you know, Magatia, that kind of accent. And he held on to that. So even though he was popular, he was still Russian. So there was something a little bit there that didn't quite work out as a baby face. All right. Obviously, Dusty was getting old. Older, probably nearing retirement, more being behind the scenes than in the ring. He had a few more years. I'm not saying he didn't, but long story short, he was pretty much done. And Luger being there, now you would say, okay, Luger would have taken this position. No, I don't think he was because I think personally people saw Luger as a better heel. You know what I mean? I, I've yeah, always. Luke- yeah, Luger. Luger was a heel at, at, at most of this point when Sting's first coming in too. So it's not like that he's perfectly looked at as the white meat baby face. And he kind of had that arrogant yeah. uh, attributes they gave him that, or didn't give, maybe had it on his own, but uh, yeah. that they honestly, you, you couldn't get on board with him as much as you could get on board with everybody's hero. I mean, Sting was the answer in Crockett to WCW to what Hogan was. Exactly. I mean, he, exactly. he was that white meat, can't do wrong, all American baby face. That's what I mean. Exactly. So Sting <laughs> was that all American baby face. Warrior, however, did not come across in that way. So would Warrior have been ready in the very same spot? They need him early on to be everything that he can be, you know? Because if you think about it, Jim Crockett and the NWA, they always focus their title on a heel, you know? Right. Whereas McMahon always liked his on a baby face. Baby face, right. Very, very few times did a heel keep a title for very long. All right, so Flair at the Clash in 88. Does Flair make the Ultimate Warrior? First of all, though, let me ask this. It's a, this is the hour draw match, right? Mm-hmm. Could Warrior have win an hour draw? <laughs> I mean, that's that's the question there. So, I mean, if you answer that, you can. I don't think he could have. Yeah. I, from what I saw, Warrior could not have wrestled enough to go that hour draw. Right. So then, what's the gimmick here? What's the uh, Do you did, get a disqualification on Flair because he's getting beat up too bad and the horsemen come in and interfere? Right. Uh, that's where I don't know that I can – that's where the story kind of gets hard to get off the ground – from Warrior's perspective. So I'm saying he can't go 60 minute Broadway draw. He okay. can't do 60 minute match. Right. So then you got to have some kind of gimmicky finish to make them both look strong. He's right. not ready for the title. Sting wasn't ready for the title. 
So then you have to do some kind of DQ or uh, some kind of funky, dusty finish, I guess. Right. And you have maybe he maybe wore your pins flare and he got his foot on the rope and the ref didn't see it. And then they replay it and they strip the title. And then yeah. there's a tournament to crown the champion or something like that. Right. I don't know, but I just do not think Warrior could have went an hour Broadway. So does he get made here? Not completely. Flair yeah. could have made him look really good, but he doesn't make him fully there. Yeah, and no, I agree with that. Now, the one thing that Jim Crockett and their crew was always really good with was doing big things with what they got. You know mm. what I'm saying? They always worked. I mean, they made Nikita a baby face because it had to happen at that time. So they were always good at doing with what they had. All right, so let's just say Flair, that was a bit of a bump in the road. Didn't really make the warrior because you know not too long after this i think what 91 or 92 rick flair and the warrior do actually work together right and you know rick flair said it was the hardest job he's ever done as far as you know a warrior beat the crap out of him so if you're thinking 88 to 92 could warrior have been more moldable i don't know what happened to warrior before his becoming a pro wrestler that was not the same as sting you know i mean his upbringing yeah. Yeah, I mean, he had, was there something with his dad? I, I'm trying to remember. There was there something with his dad, but there was something. And, and so on the dark side of the ring, if you've never seen the, um, the ultimate warrior one, there's a time when they talk about how there's an incident. Was it with Dick Murdoch yeah. and sting? I reckon Dick Murdoch just beats the crap out of sting basically. Cause right. maybe he was like chasing his woman or something like that. And is it Dick Slater, Dick Slater, Dick Slater. Sorry. Yeah. That's my bad. You're fine. But anyway, um, so then it's like after that, supposedly Sting, I don't know if somebody got to him and, you know, kind of educated him, but Sting apparently had a change in attitude. He was yeah. kind of similar to Warrior at that point, but he had right. a change in attitude after that. And he was really willing to work and learn and he wanted to learn at that point. Yeah. yeah. And the Warrior never received that. Yeah. And that and, and that, that could be the turning point right there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that might be that might be like the uh if you've watched the Loki show, like the, the time variant spot where they like yeah, br branch off time to change, change the, the, the future. Um, so without that, I mean, like, does, does, does warrior get his butt kicked and then, you know, he changes and sting doesn't, you know, I mean, like, or does he quit, you know, or does he quit? Right. Cause if Dick Slater whips your ass and then you don't, Flair doesn't get you over in the same manner he got Sting over. It could end right there. But let's just pretend in the best sense here that the Flair Warrior deal was seen as something less than what we're painting it as. Let's just say maybe it, it did. It made him a little bit. It, it got it him a little, him a little bit. bit. Yeah. Right. So his next few feuds go like this. It would be Warrior versus Wyndham for the U.S. title. He didn't win right. that, but he did have a good feud with Wyndham. Then he works a TV title feud with Rotunda. Right. And, uh, and he wins the TV title, right? And then he wins the TV title. He does. Yes. And that makes him the TV champ in 1989. He also, during around that time, he gets into a feud with the Road Warriors. And they end up working each other, Starcade 88. And he actually tags with Dusty. Right. And... And so him and Dusty, a kind of an age Dusty. Now, again, what would this have all been? Magnum doesn't get an accident. You know, Sting, their UWF maybe doesn't get bought out, whatever. Long story short, we can't really paint that much, but the Warrior and Dusty tag team, you know, this is a TV title champion Warrior, and you've got Dusty and the Road Warriors in a tag team match. Now, again, Warrior and Dusty. Does that work the same way Sting does? Again, that ass whipping by Dick Slater seemed to really be some kind of pivotal moment for him that actually humbled, humbled Sting, you know, yeah. versus would the warrior have even been here? Now, again, let's just pretend that he does okay with that match. And then, you know, he works against the Road Warriors and they work a very similar style. You know, and, and the this, warrior and road warriors are supposed to be heel here too, right? They are the very heel. hard, to, very hard to do. And I don't know that they actually fully got over his heels. I don't know. You know, well, is this when they spike Dusty and all that? They spike that, Dusty in the eyeball. Yeah, I mean, and people were like, "Yeah, spike him, beat mm -hmm. his." You know, mm -hmm. it's like get that fat 
You know, right. it's like, uh, so did he really? I mean, I, I mean, yeah. so, okay, taking back my argument a little bit, Warrior was not that white meat, all American baby face. Yeah. So can you, does it even work to try to make the word warriors heal against the, against the ultimate warrior? Because Sting, you can at least get some sympathy. Sting won't get Ricky Morton's sympathy, right. but he'll get some sympathy from the fans. I don't know that the Ultimate Warrior gets that same sympathy in that fight. Right. And I don't know how that works. But working with the Road Warriors, working with Dusty Rhodes, would increase his career, I would think. It right. may not increase it like it increased Sting's, but it right. would increase it. So I think one thing we're seeing right here with Ultimate Warrior, and I could be wrong, uh, we'll never know for sure. I think his ascent would be a slower ascent in Jim Crockett WCW than it was in the WWF. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And slower than stings in the WCW Jim Crockett promotions. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. You're exactly right. And that's a great point. And then to go down the timeline a little bit, of course, he's in the, he's the TV champ in 89. And then he starts working a feud. Some say it's one of his better feuds, even maybe possibly up there with the Ric Flair feud in working with the great Muta, as uh, yeah. Gary, as Gary Hart would say, the Muta. Man. Muta. Anyway, he works the feud with Muta at the Great American Bash 89. His trajectory is continuing. Let's pretend like the Warrior. I mean, I just don't know. I can't see the Warrior and Muta being a good combination. I don't know. I, I, I just don't, man. You know? I, I mean, that's that's where that's where the struggle continues. I don't see yeah. Muta and Warrior as being as good a showdown as Sting was. Sting was really... And Sting wasn't perfect when he came to Crockett, but Sting right. grew and grew and grew and grew as he worked. I just don't know that I can see the warrior growing in his working. He may have been over, but he right. would have been over in something similar to the way that the road warriors were over. Just brutal. Just right. Chew you up and spit you out. Right. And I don't know that that's what you needed with with Muda. No, and you needed more than this from the warrior at this point because right. you know, again, they need a they need a knight to kill the dragon. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. And the warrior is more, I don't know, like Conan. <laughs> I, th <laughs> yeah. I think Muda could have done great. It could have done fine in the feud. I just don't know that I could see Warrior doing reciprocating in the feud. Right. Right. And and that could have been very ugly. And again, it would have been unfortunate. So Muta, unfortunately, let's just pretend like he gets by that one. And then he tags with Flair versus Funk and Muta at the Halloween Havoc 89. To hear the actual story on that, listen to episode 20 of Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling. Anyway. Of course, he works that. That could work. I could see the the warrior in that match. That's you know. Yeah, that, that match would be fine for the warrior. I think. You, I don't know that it gets him over any better, but he, that match works fine. It works fine. He can work in a feud with those guys. It would make sense. So then, obviously, the biggest thing and possibly Sting's biggest feud coming next is with the four horsemen feud works against Tully and Arn. He works in different setups with different guys. Long story short, he ends up culminating in a match with flair at the great American bash, 1990. Again, we know stings path ultimate warrior in this same path. It leads to flair, <sighs> man. So he's got two years under his belt since the match with Flair. Let's just say that. His first match with Flair at the Clash, where Flair yeah. tried to make him. And then essentially here, he's going to become the champion. So is the Warrior even in the picture at this point? If he is, is it in the same you know, place? <sighs> I just don't know that he would be over enough at this point. Yeah, like is he for them to give him the? They may have given him the the match. I just don't know that he would have won like Sting did. Yeah, I mean, is it eventual? It's just going to happen. It's no way to fight it. Or is he under a different persona? Is he in a match that's not as important as this one? Because you know, Flair's like maybe he's working. Well, they tried to put him in the U.S. title picture yeah, first, possibly. Ooh. I don't know who the U.S. champ was at the time, but they have tried to make him the U.S. champ, like built him maybe a little mm -hmm. slower because, like, like I said, he had to go slower. God, him and Luger would have been a terrible match. It would have been terrible, you know. But, I mean, on the Halloween Havoc 89, Pillman worked 
Luger through an incredible match. But even though Luger is similar in body type, I still say Luger's a better wrestler than Ultimate Warrior because he at least can sell. You know, I never yeah. really saw the Warrior sell, so there's not enough give and take in his matches for me to believe that he is something that could be, you know, you got to get beat down for the, your comeback. And yeah, I just like, I think Luger is pretty far above Warrior as far as a yeah. worker. And that's not, and I'm, I'm not bragging on Luger. And if you love the Ultimate Warrior, I love the Ultimate Warrior as a kid. Trust me. I'm still a fan of the ultimate warrior. I just see him for what he, he is as far as a worker. And it's just limited, yeah, right. limited is the best word you can say. And the persona, the superhero esque that he was given in WWF, he wouldn't have been given that in the NWCW uh, Crockett, whatever right. you want to call it. Right. So it, it's different. I agree. I mean, but, but at this point, he's at Flair. And let's just pretend that the Warrior takes the title from Flair. Let's pretend that all the cards line up and take him through Flair to win the title. Then, eventually, he ends up in a feud because Flair leaves and goes to WWE or WWF. Right. And he ends up in a feud with the new big heel, and that is Rick Rude. Now, we know the Warrior has met up with Rude in, in his actual career when he went to the WWF. He met up with him against him in World Class. He worked against him early on after his jobber matches. He works with Rick Rude, and then Rick Rude apparently beat his ass in a match one time because he kept potatoing him, and Bobby Ooh. Heenan told the story that he said, hey, quit hitting me, and Rude just gave him receipt after receipt because he was tired of getting potatoed so listen at this his next feuds and this will pretty much lead us to the end of our conversation about what if ultimate warrior rick rude lex luger big van vader so those next three opponents after his flair win he basically trades the title back and forth with all of those people right there and i could see rick rude humbling him at that point if he needed that i could see luger being, like you said, a very bad match. <laughs> very bad. I mean, I'm sorry. I was a big Lex Luger fan as a, as a kid, too. And, I mean, I still like to watch old Lex Luger stuff. But it's just limit. He's limited, too, but he's not as limited as Warrior. Right. And and you've got, if you think about this, the Warrior in its in his own right is as great looking as Luger, if not, you know, similar, almost better. But the looks can only take you so far now hopefully he's progressed enough as a performer if he went this route and maybe we could just say this sting is definitely a better wrestler maybe he's naturally a better performer than the warrior you know the war yeah maybe he's I, I don't know much about sting's like younger life did he play football did he play yeah. you know other sports i don't really know that about warrior i don't think warrior really did yeah. So maybe Sting has just more natural athletic ability, that and therefore be. he looks a little better in the ring. I tell you, of those three feuds you named, Rude, Luger, Vader, the top feud there to visually watch has to be Rude. I mean, as far as with if, if the Warrior is taking the place here, Rude is definitely the feud that's better to watch. Um, it might have been pretty decent of yeah. a feud. Um I can almost I don't see the Vader being all right, though. I don't know why. I, I well, almost okay. Will he sell for Vader though? He would have to because Vader would have beat his ass. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I'm just saying, if he doesn't sell for Vader, then it's a terrible matchup right. as well. Right, uh, it, it could be. It very well could be, and and that could be the reason he quits wrestling forever. Is Vader beats his ass? Now again, that could have been as as Jim Ross could say, bowling shoe ugly. But at the same time. It couldn't be. It could be all right. Who knows, man? You yeah. Know? So if he'll sell for Vader, that that's an all right one too. Yeah. But if he doesn't, that ends his career with Vader beating his ass. Vader Vader whoops his ass. So you know, again, we learn a few things. We learned that one thing is is that Sting through those years did not have an easy road to hoe. He's working Rude. He's working Luger, who to get a good match out of Luger probably isn't easy. And he's working against Vader, which, you know, Flair has said that Vader beat him up 
a lot, you know, and, and Sting probably took a, a good whooping from Vader too, just because Vader was was notoriously a receipt giver without any kind of <laughs> without a need to give a receipt. Yeah, with without any purchasing. <laughs> yeah. No so, proof of purchase necessary. So yeah, I don't know. But my point of reference is is I'm not sure that Ultimate Warrior even makes it to the Great American Bash in 1990. Maybe he goes somewhere else. Maybe he ends up in the WWF too. But what about what about Warrior's match that would have been in Crockett and WCW with uh, Mean Mark Callis? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? But either way, I mean, unless you have anything more to say about the Warrior, I think we should go over to the Sting side. I just know that... Um, with Warrior, I don't think he would have been as popular as Sting. I don't think he was matches would have been as good as Sting's if he's on Sting's path. And I don't think that he would have ultimately been as big a persona and as big a I mean, he still sells merch. Okay. I mean they W WWF will put out figures all day long of the Ultimate Warrior because they will sell. Yeah. I mean, he still moves the needle. Right. I just don't think if he had been in the other place, he would have moved the needle as much. He absolutely left a huge mark in the industry. He is, you know, is shock and awe almost is what he reminds me of. He is, he was a singles performer in the style of the Road Warrior tag teams. And I think that helped him a lot, being that he, essentially could be that badass and be that way but i tell you what we're going to take a little break listen to a couple of our buddies podcast commercials and let's say what if sting took the ultimate warrior's path there you go we'll be right back in a world that has been completely divided for so long two movie fans have decided to unite for the people and the betterment of mankind one an action movie buff. Hey, mother. The other, a horror movie fanatic. <laughs> Together, they will try to bridge the gap of both genres into one podcast with their battle cry. Give me back my action and horror movies. Listen along as Charlie and Nate alternate each week talking about action and horror movies they cherish, mostly from the VHS era. Also, including some modern examples that felt like the movies they grew up with by answering the battle cry. Give me back my action and horror movies. Available wherever you listen to podcasts. Look them up on Facebook and Instagram. Hey, 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 it's the Heat Boss of Scotty Blaze, and I'm inviting all of y'all to join me on my podcast, Turning Up the Heat with the Heat Boss of Scotty Blaze. Yep, that's me talking to you right now. So what are you waiting for? Come on over and join me. I'll be covering all the events of the day, global, national, pop culture, movies, gaming, whatever sounds interesting. I'll also be playing some awesome skating shuffle music from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, anything that has a good beat, I'm going to be playing it. You could rest assured so what are you waiting for come on over from my website tuthradio.com the podcast is on every major podcast platform join me won't you see you then all right we are back with what if sting and the ultimate warrior so you've just heard us discuss how the ultimate warrior may or would or possibly could have done going down sting's path now this is honestly the reason i wanted to do this show this part right here is if sting took the warrior's path in Tri Cities. No, I'm just yeah. <laughs> Warriors Path State Park. Yeah. yeah. So let's pretend that Sting is on the Warriors Path State Park. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so all right. So Sting, he 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 goes to world class. You know, does his thing. He's managed by Gary Hart, Percy Pringle. You know, he gets turned into a face, and then he starts working with. Lance Von Erich, and then 87, when he left for WWF, he became the ultimate Sting. Now, of course, I'm not going to say all that, but Sting starts out working, you know, the job guys, and I can see this being good for Sting, you know, getting him over as a badass, you know, right. getting him 
reps with guys who can can make him look like a million bucks. Again, it's somewhat Rick Flair what Rick Flair did for him, but at the same time, it's guys like Steve Lombardi and Barry Horowitz and those guys helping him out. Then he starts working some angles and you know like we think of Goldberg and all these people uh, Ultimate Warrior is kind of like the Goldberg of his generation or whatever but Ultimate Warrior did not keep an undefeated streak early on the warrior was beaten by Rick Flair okay so I mean Rick Rude so Rick Rude let's pretend like he's working a jobber and then his in his first few matches on house shows and stuff Rick Rude is actually beating him now I think personally at that time it was maybe a humbling experience for the warrior Possibly for Rude to go over. Also, Rude was on a trajectory of his own as a heel, so maybe that was just inconsequential to Vince. And he said, okay, we'll put him over, and you can put him over, and it's the battle of the bodies or whatever. But the first big feud for Sting would be against Hercules in 1988. So rest in peace, Hercules Hernandez, Ray Hernandez. He's gone through many different gimmicks but one of my very favorite gimmicks of all time is the hercules gimmick i i always loved it i loved the chain that he wore even though he was a bad guy i always thought he was super cool had a great look his ljn figure i don't think i remember seeing him in that get up that he wore it once i think yeah not much but they put him in a figure in it and you know it was probably a pain in the ass to deal with you know all that leather connected by metal and stuff but he, yeah. he's working hercules and again did hercules do much good for the warrior at this point i doubt it but i doubt it I, I can theoretically see him and sting having some pretty good matches together you know and they may have even had him later on when hercules came to the wcw i'm not 100 percent sure on that but sting and hercules I can see that being a pretty good feud right there, don't you? Yeah, I can see uh, definitely Sting playing the face in peril. I mean, you know, Sting was muscular, but I think you have Hercules come out and, you know, these matches probably need to be about 10, 15 minute matches. And you could have, you know, Sting getting beat down for the most of it and then kind of hulking up in a way and uh, beating his chest and coming back and getting the scorpion death lock and and winning or you know whatever i just i think i think it would have been good i don't really remember the warrior and hernandez or hercules matches but i think they would have been better than those oh yeah totally now keep in mind sting was gradual growing you know they needed him early but they didn't overdo him they didn't push him too quick the warrior had a rocket strapped to his back. The only person truly in the way of the warrior being the number one was Hogan and Hogan. He had been the top dog, the King of the mountains since he started. So, you know, in my perspective at this point, sting is on the same trajectory as the warrior was, but at the same time, knowing that Hogan, you've got a, I'll say it better look, possibly almost as charismatic guy coming for you. And, you know, I think sting would have concerned Hogan a little sooner, maybe than the warrior did, you know, possibly. Yeah. So did now I've heard this before. Vince wanted somebody in place because he kind of thought Hogan might go to Hollywood, right? Yeah. He was about to dip. That's what he was. Thinking. And, and he did. So he did like several projects in Hollywood. And, and I think there was concern with Vince that Hogan would, you know, stay in Hollywood and, right. uh, and not not do as much wrestling or anything like that. Right. Uh, he he didn't ultimately. Uh, right. But he he was worried that so he wanted the the warrior in place, and that's part of the reason the rocket got strapped to his back too. That's a good point. That's a good point. And Vince has his own. You know, that's the other <laughs> that's the other equation that we haven't really put in as much as Vince was in this equation. So yeah. it could have you know, Sting could have you know, been on a totally different path than the warrior because, you know, I think Vince said that they tried to get sting and they gave him the hard press a few times, but you know, he never jumped, but again, we're pretending what if on this. So the next big deal after Hercules honky tonk, man, SummerSlam 88, you know, at this time, this real Sting was working Wyndham, Rotunda, the Road Warriors. Now, he, he's in WWF now, we're pretending, and he's at the SummerSlam, and he basically beats the Honky Tonk Man in a squash. I don't think much of that would change. Do you? I don't. Yeah, I do think something would change. I don't think Sting 
would have needed to beat him in 10 seconds. Right. Yeah. I think they could have had a 10, 15 minute match with Sting basically crushing him the whole way. Was it a timing issue though, or something? I felt like it was a timing issue maybe, but I could be wrong. Maybe it was just a powerful put over, but I I can't remember that. It may have been a timing issue in there, but but I don't think you would have, I don't. Yeah. And And maybe, and and you could have done sting. Absolutely. Could have came out. What I would like, here's what I would envision. If you do the same match, if you do the same squash really fast, with Sting. Sting comes in, you know, clotheslines him a time or two, slings him in the corner, Scorpion, or, or the big splash, and then yeah. Scorpion, Deathlock, tap out. Right. You know, I'll say this. Sting also got a way better finishing move than the Warrior did. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> the Warrior may have one of the worst finishing moves of all time. Yeah, because it just looks like it's painful, man. You know? I mean, yeah. power of slam that just drops somebody. Oh, and then with finish with the splash, the splash right. is just terrible. The, the splash is just terrible. Anyway, I, I, I agree. It's one of those bad moves that should have been on a top 10 somewhere, but yeah. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> but so he goes over the honky tonk, man. And let's just say that was a better match. If they needed it to be, it could have definitely been a, better it could have match. definitely been a better match if they needed it to be, if they needed it time constrained, it yeah. could have been, it could have been exactly what it was. And look just as good, if not better, than the Warrior. And then listen to this buildup. Now, again, the Warrior went on this path, but Steen could have easily, you know, like you said, the time variant could have broken off at any point here. But if he's going down the same path as the Warrior, you've got Rick Rude next as the big feud. So this is essentially the Intercontinental title feud. And he and Rick Rude, you know, have some decent matches. I remember this feud, watching this feud. They had some good ones. Now, again, I didn't know that he was potatoing Rick Rude at the time and Rick Rude had to give him a few receipts but you know I remember this leading up to a weasel match where Bobby Heenan redid his weasel suit match that he did also at AWA you know and I remember all this so he's kind of you know even though he beats Honky Tonk Man he starts going against the the Bobby Heenan's crew which I guess they were the top heels they were the four horsemen of the WWF kind of deal so you have Rick Rude he goes into a decent feud with Rick Rude I could easily see Sting going through that and and being being built even more, you know. And that then leads to the boss man, which if you're about to feud with Hogan and Hogan just beat this guy and a huge epic match in one of Hogan's, you know, signature matches, you've got Andre. So he starts to feud with Andre. Now, unfortunately, Andre is not the same Andre that Andre was even four years before this or three years right. or two. Yeah, three. So, you know, he's broken down. So I see this one differently in that I could still see Sting working with Andre better than. I, th- I think Sting could have made. Andre looked great. Yeah. Even in his broke down state, I think Sting could have sold for him like in some bear hug type things. Yep. And he would have made Andre look better than the warrior could have. Oh, totally. And, you know, Sting, he probably doesn't get him in the Scorpion death lock, but he stinger splashes him and he drops and he pins him. You know, I could see this being a very similar match to Hogan and Andre at WrestleMania. He probably gets a body slam in there, too. They probably get him body because because they want to match Hogan, kind of. They want to see... They want to yeah. build the Hogan and they, you have to know that at this point, they already know they're going to pit him against their top dog. It's inevitable, right? You got and title that, versus title. Yeah. Title versus title. Again, keep in mind, he has not lost the intercontinental title. So he works Andre and then boom, automatically it's the ultimate showdown sting versus Hogan at WrestleMania 1990. Now, this match was massive. I remember when we were kids, this match was massive, you know? Yeah. We, I mean, it was a big deal, right? It was, I mean. Oh, huge, huge. The Warrior versus Hogan. I mean, I remember being for Hogan. Were you for the Warrior? Or were you for Hogan? I probably was for Warrior, honestly, if I'm thinking right. Yeah, because, I mean, it's almost like He-Man versus the turtles, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's like he man's going out, but the turtles are coming in. It's Hogan versus the ultimate warrior. It's primary colors versus neon. <laughs> yeah. It's just a, a mega showdown. Now at this point, does Hogan 
say, no, I can't do this with Sting? Or is Sting just handed the title happily, do you think? What do you, what do you think in this perspective? Okay. What do you – I'm trying to remember from what I know. So did Hogan have to give the okay to give the title up kind of, or was it Vince's call? I think it was Vince's call, and I think it was inevitable because, like you said, Hogan was doing some Hollywood stuff that he needed right. to get away and could not take the title with him. So I think it was partially that, but I do think it was a little more, you know, like how Hogan and Sting eventually met up. We covered it in our first What If, Starcade, you know, 98, where it was a horrible finish. It wasn't properly done in any way. I just don't see it the same way here. But here's the thing, man. If you're Hogan... You know, the warrior looks different than Hogan. They do. It's not like bleach mm. blonde. From you know, Venice Beach. <laughs> from Venice Beach, exactly. <laughs> Great charisma, good on the microphone, that kind of thing. Versus the warrior is like something totally different. So Hogan's like, well, I'm not giving it to what I would say a carbon copy of me. But it would Sting's humble attitude and ability to, you know, be a part of a team have overruled Hogan's concerns for being a clone of him, you know? All right. Okay. So here's what I'll say. Sting's attitude should have made it way easier for Hogan to have done this. Yeah. Sting's work rate should have been way easier for Hogan to have done this. Right. Would Hogan have felt more threatened with, you know, Sting seemingly being, Kind of a replacement, a big, like a more exact replacement. Right, right. Like, a, or, a, or a 2.0 replacement, kind of. Yeah, yeah. She he may, have, car. Yeah. he may have got his feelings hurt. Right. And right. wanted to buck a little bit and be like, nah, Vince, I'm, I, I, you know, I really don't want this. Ultimately, if Vince had to say so, Sting wins the title. I have heard it said, I heard uh, Jim Ross talk about it before. Hogan did an amazing job at WrestleMania six of having a, as about as good of a match as he could have had with warrior. Yeah. So I'm going to say just for the hope. So sake that since Hogan was so willing to have that match with warrior and warrior was prickly, not as easy to get along with stiffer working. I'm going to say, especially because Vince is wanting it. He drops the title to Sting, and they have a great match, honestly. Great match. Yeah, I agree. I do think it's it's probably maybe, you know, it could have changed things because that could have been what Hogan talked about. Because, you know, Hogan never really talked about the Warrior match as much as he's talked about the Andre match. And that makes sense because he won the Andre match. He lost the Warrior match. It wasn't uh, his match. It was Warrior's match. Exactly. You know. It was Warrior's yeah. match. So if you look at the perspective here. Steam was made in Clash 1, 1988 with Flair. He was a household name at that point. It took till 1990 for Ultimate Warrior to truly get made. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He was over and he was very popular, but to get over as the champion, as the dude that meant something as a viable opponent, it took until nine. I mean, I'll argue that it took until the mania at six for Hogan to put him over. So there's two years behind there. Did Sting already get over with somebody else like a Rick Rude or a Honky Tonk Man or Andre or whatever before he gets to Hogan? That could be argued there. But, you know, Sting to me, I I, I agree. I think it's going to be a hundred percent better match. Sting and Hogan probably would have been possibly considered one of Hogan's greatest matches because Hogan could still do more at that point, you know, and Sting would have been probably at his best, almost greatest look, you know, as far as surfer Sting. You know, that's another thing we haven't really discussed. You know, Sting had his own look, but could it have modified earlier? I, I'm not as worried about the aesthetics of, of it no. as much as I am about the matches. But at the same time, that's also something that could have been modified by Vince just because he wanted to, you know. With that being said, he leads into, after he wins the title, then he becomes kind of like this guy that works you know in tag teams with people so like he, he teams with lod and carrie von eric against demolition at a survivor series they were the warriors so sting in that part i could see it totally fitting it wouldn't have been the warrior tag team but you know what i mean it would have still brothers and yeah it'd been something it, it could have been cool 
it could have been cool that he easily fits into that one. No brainer. Then of course he loses the title to Sergeant Slaughter at the rumble 91. Now this was something to do with his pay. Vince not trusting that warrior wasn't going to hold him up or something. I believe well, no, what, no, wasn't he demanding money. He was demanding. Money. He was demanding money. And you know, a lot of so wrestlers, like Vince, so like yeah, Vince maybe paid him, but then fired him. Well, you know, and a lot of wrestlers, they take off the, the draw. And what that means is the, the promoter, generally has the money from the house. He gets paid from the building for the money for the house. And they usually have quite a bit of cash. And then what they'll end up doing is a lot of wrestlers will take a payment towards their paycheck. So if they need some spending money, they'll be like, hey, can I take part of the draw? So what they'll do is say they get a $1,000 paycheck. They want to take $500 to have some cash in their pocket. So they'll pay them $500 and deduct it from their paycheck when they get, I think they get paid the 15th and the 30th of every month. I'm pretty sure I've heard that from several different WWE performers. Anyway, long Long story short, he was holding him up for more money. So he gets put over for slaughter. Now, of course, slaughter's turned heel. You know, he was he was working the the Iraqi, you know, Saddam Hussein Gulf War was going on. So, you know, slaughter is one of the most hated heels of all time at this point, you know. Does Sting get put in that position to where he has to put over slaughter? I, I don't see it happening. I just don't I don't either. It. I don't see Vince wanting to take the title off of Sting to put it on Slaughter. I don't yeah. see it. I agree. So that changes everything there. Of course, Sting would then end up probably working him again at WrestleMania, maybe Hogan at WrestleMania again for the title in Sting Hogan 2. You know what I mean? I can see that happening. And I just don't see Sting losing the title after this, unless there was something that happened with an injury or something to that effect. That could have changed everything, dude, because then what if Hogan went to WCW at that point, you know? Well, and here's also a thing to take it into account. Everybody, I've heard it so many times, talks about how loyal Sting was to yeah. WCW. Right. Loyal, very loyal. So right. if Sting is that loyal to Vince McMahon, I mean, you're looking at, and let me just, uh, I know, I know going way down the road here, but just think of how killer it could have been to see Sting versus Stone Cold Steve Austin. Oh, yeah. I'm, oh, my gosh. Yeah. That would have been a torch passing moment right there. And they've worked together. They've worked. Together. Right. They've worked together. Right. Dangerous Alliance stuff and, and stuff like that. But, yeah. So, you've got at that point, you've and you you did jump ahead, but that's fine. So, let's pretend like Hogan. I, just, and, well, I was just thinking down the road. Sorry. They, they do the return match. Hogan staying at Mania 91. And then after that, he wor- Ultimate Warrior works Savage in a retirement match where Savage actually retires. And so that would have not changed. Sting would have worked no. Savage. It would have been a great match. Definitely probably better than anything Savage and the Warrior could have done. Oh, totally. And Sting and Savage make up a great match. Sting retires Macho Man there. He ends up working Taker, Jake the Snake. I think that's a very underrated storyline, the Ultimate Warrior Jake. That didn't get to finish because of the Warriors issues, but because of the letter he wrote to McMahon and yeah, but so you've got those guys. And then I think sting works well with taker there. I think he works well with Jake. I think sting starts to work with these new guys. I could see Bret Hart coming and working sting in a great match, you know, yeah. Shawn Michaels. I mean, theoretically sting could have bridged the gap between Hogan and stone cold, you know, yeah. and, and, and that could have changed a lot for, for Brett and Sean. Who, Brett and Sean, right. What could that have done? Because, you know, the warrior was set to become the new generation heavyweight champion and he fumbled it, but I don't think sting would have. And you put sting in that predicament again, you never know, but I don't know what that does for Brett and Shawn Michaels. So my only, one of my only things that make you wonder uh, if, if sting would have worked totally in, in the WWF, Would he have developed as a worker? And not to say Sting's the best worker of all time. That's not what I'm saying here. But would he have developed as a worker like he did in facing Flair and facing the Four Horsemen and facing all those he did in in Crockett and WCW? Would he have became the worker he did? Now, you say he would have worked nice with some of those uh, 
enhancement talents for that warrior work at first, but that's not the same as working a 60 minute Broadway with Ric Flair. You're right. So maybe I think Sting had to work ethic and I think he had a good attitude. So I think there's a very good chance he could have became the, the same thing or better or differently good. Yeah. But I mean, there I mean, is a possibility he doesn't become as good because he's not, you know, made with one of the best ever. But maybe he has a killer feud with Shawn Michaels yeah. that, I mean, with or Bret Hart that are both top tier all time workers. Right. You know, he he give give me an Iron Man match with him and Sean or him and Bret Hart, and it might have been fantastic. And I think it makes it a little more. You know, they say parody in the NFL and stuff. I think it gives it parody. His ability to work a sixty minute match leaves him susceptible to a smaller guy beating him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah. the Ultimate Warrior comes in shock and all, like he did the Honky Tonk Man, knocks the crap out of him, it stuns him, pins him. It's over with. If Sting were to wrestle, Honky baby, Honky baby, Honky, yeah, Honky baby, and Sting in that perspective would not have been doing that. So Sting again by working the man that he did leaves himself susceptible and makes him an overall better performer that can work with smaller guys like a savage like a mm -hmm. bread heart like a Shawn michaels and also he can work the bigger guys whereas the warrior kind of was a little bit one-sided on that that's a that's a good point but i do see sting working well on until the attitude era Again, we would have missed out on his, you know, descending from the rafters. I definitely don't see Warrior <laughs> in that. In no, I don't see Warrior in that at all. No, the Ultimate Crow. You know, I, I just don't. I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I just don't see him working in that aspect. He wouldn't have. He wouldn't have. Um, for them to tell him to, you know, kind of to be. I don't know. Could he have developed into that? He might could have developed into like a brooding like character, but could he have developed into somebody? who yeah. was kind of there to right all the wrongs in WCW. I don't know. Yeah, but think about this. What about this? Let's say the time variant that we keep talking about where Sting breaks off and comes <laughs> to the WWF. Think about this. He breaks off, and Hogan had already been in the WCW for a while, turned into Hollywood Hogan, and then all of a sudden, in the rafters, WCW, one day, you see Sting in the crow makeup. He's got a totally different look than how he was in the WWF. Let's say he sees that The Rock and Stone Cold and Triple H are coming along, they're taking over. And Shawn Michaels, and Bret Hart. Yeah. He makes, he, he, you know, WCW's paying big paychecks. Let's say they get him, he He's in the rafters. That's his introduction to WCW. Whoa. I mean, dude, you know. that's killer. That's yeah. killer stuff right there. I mean, you know, maybe better than how it went. I mean, as yeah. much as I love that storyline, that might be better. You know, an old nemesis that Hogan. Yeah. That, you know, and that the time variant gets fixed, you know, the time. Yeah, fixes there you itself. go. Because there then the go. warrior can still come back and do that little one off deal he did with Hogan and, you know, all that. But again, you know, the time variant fixes itself and he comes back as Sting. You know, again, folks, these are all hypotheticals. And hell, if you're still listening, I'm impressed at this point. So, so you know, we appreciate y'all for listening to this. I think to kind of wrap this up and, you know, we'll, we'll go into our next segment in just a second. But to wrap this up, I think in all honesty, it's not surprising that Sting would have thrived where the warrior would have probably fallen. I don't think they're they're even though their paths changed, I don't think the outcome would be any different. You know now, what I mean? I talked about Jim Ross talking about earlier. I heard him talk about that they were just totally different people. Right. Warrior was hard to get along with. Warrior would come in, want his own dressing room. Sting would dress with the boys, dress with the talent. Right. Uh, easy to get along with. Right. Um, you right. know, so they're just night and day to work with. And, you know, a lot of people don't think Warrior would have uh, thrived in WCW Crockett. Yeah. Uh, they, they don't think that he would have, because they were looking for wrestlers. Right. And Warrior was more of a superhero character coming in at that point. 
totally and i i think that's i think that's pretty much it man i i mean yeah. I, I i think it boils down to the fact that would it have been cool if it would have happened yes but i don't know that anything different would have happened honestly though the only person that i see it being a positive for is sting again i could see warrior going to wcw and getting eaten up by all those working mofos down there you know they would have proved to him that he was not in the same boat as those dudes you know what i mean and again even some of the guys that he would have matched up against would have been possibly considered jobbers in wwf but Still, I think Sting would have been the only success story in that. I don't think anything would have changed for Warrior. So, only, only way Warrior is a true success story in that. And as much as I loved the Ultimate Warrior as a kid, and I'm I'm very fond of him still now. Yeah. Uh, as much as that, maybe the only way you get him back on track is if you have Ming humble him in the locker room i was gonna say if you got dirty dick slater to whoop his ass <laughs> well we'll take we'll, we'll put ming <laughs> yeah. in place of dirty dick slater so yeah yeah that could have worked but you know ming would have had his chance in wwf and he didn't do it. Too, yeah what's your problem ming but yeah. anyway well i think uh, this has been fun, jimmy man. said that not jared ming. yeah yeah I, I think this has been fun i, I you know let us know out there if y'all have enjoyed this definitely want to do more of these in the future we'll have some guests on some specialists i have buddies that are specialists in awa and specialists in world class or specialists on wcw or specialists on memphis i mean we've got endless supply of people we can bring on and talk but i felt like this was a two-man show for this one and i and i you know appreciate you you doing all this with me brother so definitely i'm I'm glad to be along for the ride yeah man well i tell you what let's take one more break here and we'll be right back with more give me back my pro wrestling welcome to the monster movie stop down where twice a month we review monster movies from all corners of the planet. Join me, Sludge. And I was, went to watch it the other night, and she's like, why are you watching this? You can quote this movie line for line. Like, that's very accurate. My co-host, Mark. Don't ask me to do a stomp down on this, because it's zero. <laughs> okay, <laughs> dude. Ruben, what's your stomp down rate? And our brother from Texas, Ruben. It, it's just, I'm like, wait a minute, dude. They tricked me into watching this. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what I felt like. like. As we give you the history, our review, and the stomp down rating of some of the best and worst monster movies around. Available through the Podbean app, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Amazon. Make sure and check us out on Facebook and Instagram. If you're a pro wrestling fan, there's something for everyone at the Cheap Heat TV Podcast Network. From the Pro Wrestling Discussion Show, Cheap Heat TV Live, to the Interview Show. The Jackson Interaction Podcast with the king of all wrestling media, Gene Jackson. To the silliness of the Whitey Jenkins Show and the brand new Zip, Xander's Irresistible Podcast with Charles Anders. You can check them all out and much more over at CheapHeatTVLive.com. And we're back with Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling. What if Sting... And the Ultimate Warrior switched paths. Man, I tell you, you know, things have been going crazy. Just recently (laughs) on Halloween, our Jamie Dundee episode dropped on the Live and in Color with Wolfie D show. And to say that it has been a success is no laughing matter because that show i'm telling you jared i look i keep up with our numbers on all of our shows and Mm -hmm. i was just every time i would look at the number it would increase by several and i'm just like man right just right now somebody is listening to that show and it's jumping and numbers would jump and numbers would jump and i'm needless to say Jamie Dundee has eclipsed and became the number one episode for the Live and in Color with Wolfie D. And I'm just telling you, y'all, if you want to hear something fun and entertaining and you don't feel too snowflakey, jump on that show. <laughs> if you don't feel... If, you yeah, don't, if you're a snowflake, you might melt Listen to that show. So Yeah, if you're easily offended... I wouldn't recommend it, but if you can get jokes and understand that dude is a nut and he has nutty stories. There was a story that he told that I've never heard on another show or a shoot or interview or whatever. And I had to kind of maneuver the story out of him, but I was glad that I did. And I got it out of him and he tells a story about him, a Gambino family woman 
Brian Christopher and another guy on a bit of a adventure and you know just go listen <laughs> to the most recent episode of Live and in Color with Wolfie D obviously I feel like our listenerships are pretty similar I know most of you have probably heard it already and thank you all so much for listening to that show as well but most importantly thank you for listening to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling you know my brother and I we do this it's a love thing we we talk about wrestling whenever we're together so we figured we would just record it <laughs> yeah, there you and, go. and i mean it's been going good so far so again i want to thank you jut as always for being my partner in this deal and i want to thank all our listeners out there everybody that you know gets involved on our social media pages brandon wheeler bob daniels you know charlie sword mason mitchell give my little brother a shout out there so many different people that listen to us and support us. We definitely appreciate y'all keeping us going. One thing I always like to say is if you can give us a rate and review, you know, that means so much to us. You don't realize how much that means to us as far as possible perspective advertising and more. And it just feels good to see that somebody's listening. And if you don't mind, just click rate and review. If you can give us a five star, I'd greatly appreciate it. If you want to write something that's even better, whatever. I think we've got some big plans in front of us, and I'm excited as those are rolling out. You know, well, you had Greg Gagne, Magnum TA, what's next? Well, you'll see. We've got some things planned. I think, you know, when you get somebody like that, the the trick is to not try to outdo yourself every episode, you know? Because you can get into that, and and I mean, I've I've got. There's know. only so far up you can go, right? I mean, like, right. I mean, like Magnum and Greg Gagne, those are pretty big names. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you can you can keep going, and uh, you you can get bigger names, potentially bigger careers, right? But but then at a certain point, you're going to run out of that. So right. We appreciate you all for listening. Again, it's the best free entertainment you can get. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we work hard at this and, and we and we just in, really enjoy being able to talk pro wrestling with our people. So go support us at our social media pages. We're at GMBMPW on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. You know, YouTube, man, we've got some great stuff on there. I know we mentioned it earlier, but we've got chic shorts that, that build up and lead to our podcast episodes. And we've got the always grouchy Mike Jablonski's pissed off so you know go check them out on there download us rate and review you got anything else for them chic no nah, man i'm just glad to glad to be on here and glad to glad to maybe uh get our opinions out there on some of this stuff with the uh, yeah what we think might happen and what we enjoyed about yesteryear of wrestling and uh, yeah. you know we we enjoy the new stuff too but uh not as much as we we did when yeah. a lot of these things we talk about are, were going on but Oh yeah, um, totally. We love wrestling, and we want we want wrestling to be as successful as it is. So, yeah, and we thank wrestling for helping us have a show to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know these little Mandela effects that we talk about in our What If series. You know they're fun, and we're going to keep doing them. So just keep listening, and and we'll see y'all next time on down the line. Once again, we thank you. We appreciate you. Have a good day. Don't forget, fight forever with a tear in my eye. With a tear in my eye. This is the greatest moment in my life. This has been a James Rock Street production.